What's up everybody? It's Chicago Talk Show host and in this video we're going to talk about Betty Page as well as some other relevant topics. We've all heard of Betty Page, the iconic 50s pinup model. Many of us have seen various images of her posing in sultry stances and in BDSM, bondage, discipline, dominance, submission, and sadomasochism. Modernity would have you believe that Betty Page was a pioneer of sorts. Things like sexual expression, woman's liberation, and the revolutionary figure. What was the meta message behind those images? Was it really just harmless pictures? Was there some sinister aspect that still affect us today? Because for her, it was just taking pictures and she knew full well what was considered sexy. She had a blast doing it. But did she really necessarily mean to be a revolutionary figure? And revolting against what exactly? Was this her purpose? I don't think so. But this is what ended up happening with her legacy. And the media, with particular vested interests in her work and what she represents, how come nobody talks about her violent history, the stabbing of people, her mental breakdowns? Nobody talks about that. They like to sweep these sort of details under the rug. Why is that? Well, maybe it's because some of these vested interests, it could hurt their business. And they don't want to do that. Would the budding Prawn business, which from now on, it's clearly a euphemism, Prawn, but actually what I'm going to refer to Prawn is, I'm going to call it for what it is, and I'm going to call it poisonography. So in this video, we're going to talk about the effects of Betty Page, what happened to her, some details about her life towards the end. We're going to talk about things like the connection between sex and violence. Betty Page, rest in peace. We're also going to ask, was she really a role model for women? But most of all, we're going to discuss in this video the lies of modernity that have to do with sexual liberation, the consequences of promiscuity, and how to, in today's age we see echoes of Betty Page's story in modern times. For my reference, I'll be using Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation and Political Control, written by Dr. E. Michael Jones. Let us begin. Dr. E. Michael Jones writes and tells us about Betty Page. In October 1950, at around the same time that the FBI was getting ready to investigate Professor Kinsey, yes, that Kinsey, that odious, dubious, detestable figure, Professor Kinsey in Bloomington, a gorgeous southern belle by the name of Betty Page was walking along the beach at Coney Island, New York, when she noticed a black weightlifter whose body she found attractive. The feeling was clear, clearly mutual because Jerry Tibbs, the weightlifting policeman, who was also an amateur photogra photographer, asked Page if she had ever modeled before. Page said that she hadn't, but the alacrity with which Page accepted his offer to do so must have indicated that she wasn't telling the truth. Since the result was the same, Tibbs didn't press the matter when she agreed to come to his studio. Lower Manhattan was a full second story lofts, which could be had cheaply because of the post-war recession. The war had created other dislocations as well, and New York was willing to capitalize on them too. Just as the Civil War had created an opportunity to exploit the sexual longings of soldiers, one which led then President Lincoln to pass the nation's first obscenity law, so World War II had spawned a business in pinups, pictures of Hollywood actresses more or less clothed which would be shipped to soldiers around the world. The demand for this sort of thing did not cease with the end of the war. In fact, fueled by things like the Kinsey Report, yes, that dubious report, the demand increased, and as it did, the demand for more and more nudity increased as well. What would become a flood of poisonography by the 1970s did not look like that at its beginning any more than the mouth of the Amazon looks like its source, but the trajectory was there even in its inception. The problem, however, was that the numbing which this sort of obscenity brought about blinded the culture to its effects. The more it saw, the less it could understand. Writing at around the same time that Betty Page was on her way to becoming the most popular pinup model in New York City, which is to say in 1948, Richard Reaver wrote in Ideas Have Consequences that our most serious obstacle is that people traveling this downward path develop an insensibility which increases with their degradation. Loss is perceived most clearly at the beginning, 
after habit becomes implanted, one beholds the anomalous situation of apathy mounting as the moral crisis deepens. It is when the first faint warnings come that one has the best chance to save himself. And this, I suspect, explains why medieval thinkers were extremely agitated over questions which seem to us today without point or relevance. If one goes on, the monetary voices fade out, and it is not impossible for him to reach a state in which his entire moral orientation is lost. Thus, in the face of, of the enormous brutality of our age, we seem unable to make an appropriate response to perversions of truth and acts of bestiality. We approach a condition in which we shall be immoral without the capacity to perceive it, and degraded without means to measure our descent. Dr. E. Michael Jones continues, Betty Page's photos, so innocuous looking by later standards, would be an important index of that descent. Eventually, one of them ended up in the hands of a man named Irving Claw, with a K, who had made his fortune selling pinups to soldiers. Claw recognizes, recognized Page's potential and was soon doing his own studio sessions with her. After the war, the demand increased for what Claw would call, quote, damsel in distress, end quote, photos, which is to say pictures of women bound and gagged for the sadomasochist crowd. Soon, Paige was posing in costumes like this for Claw. Claw didn't do nudes, but the times being what they were and the network of, quote, photographers, end quote, being resourceful, Paige was soon doing that kind of posing as well. She was also acting in 8mm movies with titles like, quote, Jungle Girl Tied to Trees, end quote. Those who look at the Betty Page photos 50 years later wonder what the big deal was all about without realizing that the big deal lies in the very fact that the viewer can no longer feel the passion the photos were intended to incite. Poisonography is something based on transgression, and the boundaries of 1950 have been so often and so thoroughly transgressed that no one can see that they were once boundaries. This numbness has become the prime political problem of our age. It has also become the main tool whereby the oppressors maintain their hold on political power. EMJ continues, Richard Foster, author of The Real Betty Page, mentions the phenomenon of numbing but never really explains it in any coherent fashion because the author himself has been numbed. Quote, after a while, end quote, Page's biographer writes without really understanding the implications of what he's saying, quote, the impact of all that flesh is numbing, end quote. Foster is writing here about the editor of a girly magazine which featured Betty's photos. He might have been writing about himself as well, but the main issue here is the fact that people who get numbed never realize that they are getting numbed. They just notice that the imagery that was once so powerful now seems so quaint. Then they go off on a search of more transgression. And what follows is, is the trajectory of lust leading to death as one taboo after another falls by the wayside. The mandarins of the liberal regime have unleashed a historically unprecedented amount of transgressive imagery into the culture, hoping that they will be able to profit from the dislocation it creates by focusing the isolation in economically profitable ways, i.e. poisonography. But no one seems to know how to stop this change reaction once it starts. And so as a result, people get murdered or go crazy when these unfettered desires get the upper hand. EMJ continues, which is what happened in the case of Betty Page. Betty led a dissolute life beginning with her 18th year while in high school. She was one of the top students in her class and planned at the time to become a teacher. By the mid-50s, when she was approaching 40, she had descended into psychosis. She had become incapable of finishing any of the, of the many Bible courses she enrolled in and was a threat to the life and well-being of those around her. Foster gives all the usual Freudian explanations, including the most plausible, the one by the way which Freud reject rejected as the seduction theory, namely that she had been molested by her father as a child. No one should minimize the trauma associated with events like that, but by the same token, the trauma in this instance took on a psychic importance the further away it receded in time, which is a good indication that it functioned as a screen memory for something more closely associated to the present, namely her sexual behavior as an adult. If the particulars of modesty are culturally relative, the consequences of lust are not. The final consequence of promiscuity, according to the order of being, 
is the dissolution of the self. The self is constituted by its relationships. The trauma of a father transgressing those boundaries might have been healed by an understanding husband in a permanent monogamous relationship, but that was not Betty's fate. The easy money from the photo sessions must have made easy relationships seem equally inconsequential, but at a certain point, psychic reality caught up with Betty, and when it did, the passage, the passions, the self aroused at will began to assert their hegemony over a self that was no longer in a position to control them. So basically what E. Michael Jones is saying is, it got to the point where Betty Page's passions took over her ability to reason and to keep them tempered and ultimately controlled her. All right, we're gonna start going hard. So let's get into more details about what had happened with Betty Page's breakdown. Let's get into it. E. Michael Jones writes, in the early oct afternoon of October 28th, 1972, when the Reich revival, as in Wilhelm Reich, was in full bloom, the police dispatcher in Hialeah, Florida, got a call from a man named Harry, who claimed that his wife had become violent and needed to be subdued. When the police officer arrived on the scene, he found the once famous pinup model, Betty Page, in front of the house, beating her husband, Harry, with her fists and bellowing curses at him. After Officer P Fitzpatrick led Betty away to the back of the police car, he returned to the house to get a statement from Harry. When he returned to the car, Betty in the back seat with her dress pulled up and her pants pulled down. I don't know if I can say this on YouTube, so I'm just gonna say, plug in a euphemism. Let's, so the cop goes to the back of the car and finds Betty um, engaging in a sexual act by herself. Put it that way. With the hanger the officer had left in the car, his verdict was that the suspect was, quote, out of her mind, completely berserk. We'll continue. Betty was found unfit to stand trial and committed to a mental institution. Seven years later, she was out in the streets again, this time living in California, when her neighbors saw her emerge from the bushes wielding an eight-inch long serrated bread knife, which Betty began to plunge repeatedly into the woman's body. When the woman's husband came to her aid, Betty began stabbing him as well. Betty had spent her adult life arousing the passions of others. Now, after a life of promiscuous relations with various men, she discovered that those same passions had taken on a life of their own and were now telling her what to do. Quote, desire doubled is love, end quote. The fifth century BC sophist Prodicus had written and quote, love doubled is madness. End quote. In the expensive school of experience, the moderns were rediscovering what the ancients had known all along. Quote, excessive passion, end quote, according to Bruce S. Thornton's reading of that tradition, quote, is fundamentally a form of insanity, a destruction of the rational mind, a destruction of the rational mind's control over the body, a suspension of reason's power that allowed the soul to be overwhelmed by the chaoses, overwhelmed by the chaos of the natural appetites and emotions, end quote. We'll keep going. Dr. E. Michael Jones writes, In 1957, Betty simply dropped out of the New York pinup scene and moved to Florida, where she became involved with a man 13 years her junior. They eventually got married. But as with her other marriages, this one didn't last either. And with each failed relationship, we can see that the glue that held her personality together was becoming more elastic and less retentive. It was at this point in her life that Betty got religion, as many women do. If she had been living in Cor Corinth during the time of St. Paul was writing to the formerly dissolute citizens of that city, she would have been told to keep her head covered and her mouth shut during religious services. Betty never had any children. By the time she was approaching 40, she must have realized that she never would have any and started to devote her spare time to raising plants by way of compensation. Quote, she meticulously watered and cared for plants, end quote. Foster tells us, quote, as if they were the children she never had. End quote. The religion Betty eventually got had little to do with the morality traditionally associated with Christianity. Betty was still good looking enough to pick up a man at a dance, which is what she did in Miami when she met a divorced telephone lineman by the name of Harry Lear. She was still interested in marriage, which is what happened once again, but she was incapable of remaining married because her craziness kept intruding into the relationship until it finally destroys it. In spite of studying theology at a number of Bible institutes, Betty came to believe that there were seven gods 
lowercase g. And she knew this because she would have extended conversations with them while locked in the bathroom. It was after an especially long conference in the home of an aging widow in California that Betty rushed out of the bathroom with a serrated bread knife in her hand and proceeded to stab her neighbor repeatedly almost killing her in the process. Betty was 49 years old at the time, and the policeman concluded that she was mentally ill, a judgment which, with which the court committed her to a mental institution and concurred. But what is a mental illness? Psychiatrists of the Thomas Zaz School compared the term, quote, mental illness, end quote, to saying that God has appendicitis. The mind cannot be ill because it is not a physical entity. In a Freudian age, the term has come to mean exculpation and the, quote, triumph of the therapeutic, end quote, to use Philip Reif's term. But what does mental illness mean? In addition to meaning the loss of behavior in conformity to the canons of what society calls civil, this state of mind means the inability of the self to integrate experiences and desires in a coherent pattern of behavior. If a healthy person is one whose self has hegemony over his desires, a mentally, quote, ill end quote, person, is someone where the opposite is the case. By the time Betty was 49 years old, her desires, whether con concupiscible or irascible, had hegemony over herself. Betty simply did what the voices, i.e. her out-of-control passions, told her to do. Rather than admit that promiscuity leads to this state unerringly, the culture which promotes sexual license chose instead to say that the monster that they had created to satisfy their illicit desires was crazy and leave it at that. Betty was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed to a mental hospital. She was described, quote, mentally ill, end quote, when a better diagnosis might have been that herself had simply collapsed under the assault of her desires to the point where the desires and not the self had taken charge of her behavior. We'll keep on going. Dr. E. Michael Jones writes, the culture which had turned her into an icon would rather not admit this fact because by admitting it would be admitting culpability in her demise. Instead, we find as the only explanation a radical discontinuity to the point of incoherence. She slept with all these guys. She went nuts, all smoothed over by the psychic numbing which 50 years of poisonography created in those who consumed it. Betty, we are told, by the way, liked horror movies, but her biographer understands the connection between sex and horror every bit as little as Betty herself, a lady who was doomed to live the trajectory she never learned to understand. The consequences of extrapolating this sort of behavior to the culture at large have occurred to others as well. Philip Cushman, writing in the May 1990 issue of American Psychologist, describes the historical trajectory that usually gets denominated, quote, liberation, end quote, by the sexual Whigs, capital W, as the, quote, the emergence of the empty self, end quote. Unlike the Victorian self, which is defined by relationship made possible by adherence, by adherence to the moral law. The current self is constructed as empty, and as a result, the state controls its population not by restricting the impulses of its citizens, as in Victorian times, but by creating and manipulating their wish to be soothed, organized, and made cohesive by momentarily filling them up. The products of the social sciences and of psychology in particular have often worked to the advantage of the state by helping to construct selves that are the means of control. Cushman goes on to say that the configuration of the self, which has emerged since the end of World War II, is, quote, empty and part of the loss of family, community, and tradition. It is a self that seeks the experience of being continually filled up by consuming goods, calories, experiences, politicians, romantic partners, and emphatic therapists in an attempt to combat the growing alienation and fragmentation of its era. Dr. E. Michael Jones concludes, the cultural paradigm of numb decadence, which Richard Weaver feared in Ideas Have Consequences, have, in other words, become the cultural norm. The sexual engineers have created a world in which sexual excess led to madness with increasing regularity. But because the instruments of culture approved of this transformation by calling it, quote, liberation, end quote, 
it was only rarely described in any accurate fashion. The numbness which resulted from the widespread dissemination of transgressive imagery of the sort that started with the photos of Betty Page was turning people into sexual monsters. So in this book, E. Michael Jones means by that is the idea that things like promiscuity and especially poisonography degrade you into this sort of animal that just seeks out this pleasure all the time. And poisonography, of course, clouds your mind and your judgment. And we're all aware that users of poisonography, after a while, they need new stimulus. They need new higher levels of stimulus to get off. And so they go into the progression is this trajectory, right? Into more depraved and degenerate things in order to get off. And it gets to the point where it reaches critical mass, where it starts getting into things like violence. Because you're so disconnected to reality and, and poisonography alienates you and it isolates you from the opposite sex. So you get a warped mind and then you start thinking, hey, violence in sex is okay. Hey, rape is okay. And it's not. But these are the things that end up happening to you as you become so as you degenerate into such an animal that you become something even worse than that. You become a monster. And not only that, you're able to become that much more controlled because the moderns would have you think that you're free to engage in all the poisonography that you want, right? And you think it's free, you think it's liberating. But you don't see the bondage that comes with that. You don't see that this, you actually, what they're telling you is the fine print is you're free to become addicted to vice. The wages of sin and vice is death. So at the end of the day, not only do you become this, this monster, right, this deviant, but you're that much more controlled because... You're not even a person anymore. You're just a person who's controlled by their passions, their lust. You can't control it, so you end up being controlled easily. You think in your mind that you're totally free to look at this poisonography and engage in this deviant and degenerate behavior, but you're not. You know, it's, it's a Marxist school of thought that the perfect slave is the one who willingly accepts their own imprisonment and thinks it's freedom. And there's a lot of doublespeak that goes with this too, that yes, sex is normal for the function of procreation, right? But of course, where we end up getting in trouble and where they like to, to muck the truth is that promiscuity is okay. And now, we're, now, it's, now it's a different thing, right? But a lot of the moderns like to just glaze over it as if it's just this innocuous thing and it, there's no consequences to it. And that's wrong. And so when people describe that Betty Page's work was revolutionary, what, what do people mean by that? So, you know, what is, what is she revolting against um, unwittingly? Well, the answer is the moral order. So... There's a, such a thing as a moral order, and I think a lot of people, if not all of us, we know inherently right from wrong. And there's a lot of rationalization, there's a lot of propaganda that would have you think otherwise, but at the end of the day, a lot of people still know, for better or for worse, what is right from wrong. And when you start deviating from that and you start trying to manipulate it, because you try to vainfully, proudly, try to manipulate reality you think you can get away with it but what ends up happening so much of the time is you still lose because you still have to contend with guilt and guilt is this nagging rock in your shoe that never goes away until you deal with it and people deal with it in all kinds of vices they'll either turn to alcoholism they'll turn to drugs right because it's easier to just numb yourself right we just got done talking about numbness right so you don't you know you're so you're engaging in vice right and you're doing these things when you know it's wrong so instead of dealing with it just keep enjoying yourself and keep numbing yourself keep sedating yourself with vices 
so that way you can pretend like you don't have to deal with it. But all, all you're doing is doing yourself a disservice and you end up hurting yourself in the long run. We're living in this world of all kinds of lies, but then on top of it, you lie to yourself. You lie to yourself, you, you choose to be willfully blind, or you choose to be willfully ignorant. And then on top of it, a lot of people have the audacity to be proud of it. And yet, there's a second school of feminine thought that it's empowering, that the idea of engaging in this sort of behavior gives that much power, right? There's this sort of P power, and I think you can, you can guess what the P stands for, but that's not true. And a lot of women like to think that, you know, what they have between their legs is a power that they can just control man, right? And sure, there's a lot of weak men out there that can get controlled by that sort of thing, and it has been noted, and it has been written about, What's the, tr the truth about that is the woman does not necessarily own or wield that power in the way that they think. It's actually the opposite. It actually, has, it actually has control over them, which is ironic. But that's why so many, so many women who engage in that kind of toxic thought still feel powerless. Because, yeah, you can you know, use that to maybe get ahead and you know maybe sleep around to advance in your job if you know if you're an actor or an actress or whatever we've all heard these stories in Hollywood or maybe to get ahead in a position so you sleep with some dude or whatever is but is that a victory you know because at the end of the day that person got what they wanted and you and so you gave your body for it so what kind of a victory is that aside from a peric one so it doesn't make any sense in looking in today's times, so this bit of news, right? This OnlyFans star stabbing her boyfriend, right? So once again, you've got this idea of highly sexualized life, Un no doubt all levels of promiscuity between the both of them independently. And as a result, so common with these sort of things is madness and violence, right? Because after a while, this that sort of behavior, it, it, it you're consumed by your passions. You're not thinking rationally anymore. So then you get to a point where you know you start thinking it's okay to stab people. So that's where that's where the madness ends up leading you. It can lead you there. And so, you know, it's so you know, here it is for you to see. And we can tell that this has been a, a an ongoing thing because uh, you know, I'll just read from the uh, news story that the relationship was tumultuous. This woman had been previously arrested for domestic battery. So a history of violence, right? But we live in a society, right? We're living in a society. <laughs> but we're living in a society where this sort of message is continues to be pushed on younger females, right? This idea of just being an OnlyFans cam girl and, and thinking that, you know, all this money is going to, you know happily ever after and so often that's just not the case and and in a lot of these cases I think it leads to this sort of this lack of peace this lack of peace because you're engaging this in this type of behavior probably a good fair bit of elevated pride from all those followers millions of people who you know worship your body and worship their passions and um, at the end of the day you end up getting consumed by it and it's another example of, you know, this person probably thinks that, you know, their body was powerful and they could just, they, that they're in, they're in control of it. They, they had the, the P power, right? No, no, it's, it, it controls you. And that's just vanity to think that you control it. You know, and then we've got the recent stuff with what had happened with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, all sorts of violence and obscenity that was going on between them just coming right out for everybody to see 2019 Depp sued heard for 50 million for defamation over the wapo article highlighted this part that heard detailed multiple instances of alleged abuse that she said occurred during their marriage and referred to him as quote unquote the monster per variety I mean, fact is stranger than fiction, but I mean, we were we just got done talking about how this sort of behavior can turn you into a monster, 
and it just so happens that Amber Heard is calling Johnny Depp a monster. I mean, the stuff writes itself. I mean, but, you know, they don't want you to know about that stuff, right? They just kind of just say, hey. hey, do what you want. Love is love. There's totally, you can totally do things and not suffer the consequences. These are all lies, right? It goes back to that fundamental idea. Uh, you know, I love this idea that just because you can, it doesn't mean that you should, right? Control yourself. Limit yourself. It's not bad. It's actually, that's actually a sign of strength. You know, being able to control your passions, control your desires, right? It's not just about constant matters of sex all the time. You know, there's other things in life to achieve, other things to do positively and productively. It's not just about getting laid, man. What do we have here from Insider? Depps took a stand in court and said that Heard had a, quote, a need for violence. Here we go, end quote, during the relationship. So there's that connection that, you know, the industry likes to sweep right under the rug, that there's a connection between sex, violence, and the results of which leads to horror, death. Depp said, quote, possessed, unquote, heard, severed his finger with a vodka bottle after an argument. Once again, no accident in those words. Betty Page had these seven gods telling her what to do, right? So one could say that Betty Page was possessed. Well, what does it mean by possession? That you're not in control of yourself. Then if you're not in control of yourself, who is? Is it demonic? Or is it your passions? Maybe it's both, but it's clearly not you. She continued that the, quote, most severe instances of sexual violence that Miss Heard had to endure, end quote, was during a fight with Depp in Australia where the actor penetrated Heard with a vodka bottle. I mean... <laughs> This part was interesting too, I'll share with you. So Amber Heard said Johnny Depp hurt himself during fights by cutting his arms and putting cigarettes out on himself. What's that all about, right? There's clearly some sort of behavior that's negative that he kind of inflicts on himself, this sort of self-destructive behavior, right? And you know, EMJ has this, EM, Dr. E. Michael Jones has this quote that I'm gonna read to you that I think um, is relevant in this case. It's also from Libido Dominandi, and he writes, The man who becomes addicted to his vice learns to love his vice while simultaneously hating himself. So think about that. We say to, and then we say to, to people, to impressionable females, young females, that, yeah, this is a champion who should totally aspire to be. You know, get a cam account. Do things naked, make a bunch of money. <laughs> what could go wrong? You know, and um, they're just lies. They're absolute, pernicious, vile lies to do with this Promethean aspect that, you know, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. You think that uh, you have control over this sort of power you may possess. There's this comic book quote that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's for both sexes. It's tough, man. You know, you know, I was a different person 10 years ago compared to now, but I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot and I can't take back what I what I've done. But um, I've, I make I make efforts to, to be better as best as I can. And so if you're kind of struggling with this poisonography, I recommend two sources. One, Logos. So spirituality, particularly Logos. Look it up, that's gonna help you. You know, these are, you know, we live in this time and age where, you know, yeah, there's, I, I like the idea of always, of a, a positive masculine uh, message to do as much as you can on your own. I think that's great. But there's things that you really can't, you can't do it all on your own. And it does have to do with the spiritual level. And so you need more than just the daily bread that you can get of this plane. You need more. So um, that'll help you. And then two, 
I recommend the easypeasymethod.org and understand that the, if you're caught up in this sort of vices, limit them. And at, at the very least, limit them. But I highly recommend just stop. You gotta stop. And your life will improve for the better. You know, you know, you don't you don't need weed. You don't need all that alcohol all the time. You don't need poisonography. There's nothing heroic about the act that's so associated with poisonography and viewing poisonography. It's nothing to be proud of. You know, despite what these people who are trying to make a buck off of you say, they don't have your best interests at heart. So, you can do it. It won't be easy, but you'll be surprised that you, you start off as best as you can. You might relapse a couple times, but you, you, you dedicate yourself. And you keep yourself busy and occupied with constructive things to better your future. And it helps that, way, and it helps a lot if you have, if you're living your life more than just for yourself, right? Me, 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 me. Like, live for something else. And um, when you have that spirituality in your life, that's gonna go a long way. So I hope you liked this video. Give me a comment, leave a like, check out my other work. And I'll see you guys soon. Peace.